Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Um, thanks um, for organizing an excellent conference. I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been a, a long conference, too, so maybe some of you are getting as fatigued as I am. So I'm going I'm to try and keep things um, pretty at a simple level. Um, and you can tell me why it's too simple. Now, I've just turned off, to make this work, I just turned off the, my own screen. So I can't start the slideshow. Tell me when I'm getting close. That one? There we go. OK. Um, so what I want to look at to, um, is whether retrocausal theories threaten free will in any way. Um, Bell apparently thought they did, right? So Bell was a big fan of hidden variable theories, as you know. And, um, um, but he, he had to contend with his own theorem. Um, he looked at non-local theories. Be nicer if they weren't non-local. He re realized there was this independence loophole. Um, but he, he pretty much always dismissed it. And um, at the beginning of the conference, Hugh um, gave you his nice handwritten letter in which he says, I have not myself been able to make any sense of the notion of backward causation. When I think of it, I lapse quickly into fatalism. Um, so here's what, um, it, it's easy to dismiss that and say, well, you know, this is a physicist talk, thinking about free will, you know, this is what happens when physicists start speculating about free will. But what I want to argue um, is that um, there's a sense in which Bell was right, that retrocausal quantum mechanics does lead to a kind of fatalism, but that it's innocuous, that its scope is very limited. Anyway, that's, that's what I'm going to try and argue. So, um, very quickly, you know, the usual bell setup, we've got you know, three directions 120 degrees apart. Experimenters on each side can choose one of those three directions labeled ABC on these, on these switches. Um, you feed in um, spin half particles in the singlet state, right? And what you get out is if the experimenters choose the same settings, the results never agree. But if they choose different settings, and the results agree 75% of the time. Then if you make some assumptions, um, you assume that each measurement results in a unique outcome. Um, you assume that the properties of one particle don't depend on the measurement outcome of the other. And you assume that the properties of a particle don't depend on which measurement is to be performed on it. Then Bell proves no method of assigning spin properties to particles is going to produce the observed outcome statistics. Right? So what are we going to do? Well, reject one of those assumptions, I guess. Um, um, unless you want to go instrumentalist. But if we, if we want to be realists and have an explanation, um, we're going to need to reject one of these assumptions. You can reject uniqueness. Um, uniqueness is rejected by the Everett interpretation. This leads to trouble with probability, and Lev will tell you why it's not really trouble, but it kind of looks like trouble. So, um, Or you can violate locality. Locality is violated by Bohm's theory and the GRW theory. This leads to trouble with special relativity. And again, Bell, in some moods, was moved to say, this looks like trouble, but it's not really trouble. Still, it looks like trouble. So we've got at least a prima facie motivation to violate independence instead. Um, now, we haven't got um, a, a fully worked out theory along these lines, but it certainly seems worth exploring. And this is what um, this is what Bell referred to as superdeterminism. Um, here's what he had to say about it on one occasion. You know, one of the ways of understanding this business is to say that the world is superdeterministic. In the analysis, it is assumed that free will is genuine. And a result of that, one finds that the intervention of the experimenter at one point has to have consequences at a remote point in a way that influence is restricted by the finite velocity of light would not permit. If the experiment is not free to make this intervention, if that is also determined in advance, the difficulty disappears. Um, so notice that he frames it um, in terms of, of free will, and that's precisely why he didn't like it. OK. Um, so as I said, we've got no um, theory along these lines, but there seem to be two options. Um, well, there's more than two, as we've, as we've learned in this conference. But here, here's. Here are two. Right. 
Um, the implausible one, right? Um, which I'll call the past common cause hypothesis, or PCC for, for, for short, right? Which seems to be what Bell had in mind by super, super determinism. Um, and that's that, um, you know, here's a space time diagram of the, of the Bell setup, right? We've got the, the source in the middle, um, the space, the, the space time trajectories of the measuring devices on the outside, and we've got these two setting events that are space like separated from the source, right? And then um, in the past, in the past joint past like cone of those three events, there's a, there's a past common cause that's somehow coordinating all three of them. Um, so the correlations come out just right. right? That's, that's one kind of way to violate independence. Um, so we, we appeal to some past common cause um, that induces the correlations between the detector settings and the detector settings chosen by the measuring, by the experimenters, and the, the properties of the particles emitted by the source um, to explain the Bell correlations. Right? Um, there's plenty of re reasons to dislike that, apart from any putative worries about free will. Right? Um, Here's what Bell said, uh, this way of arranging quantum mechanical correlations would be even more mind-boggling than one in which causal chains go faster than light. Apparently separate parts of the world would be deeply and conspiratorially entangled, and our apparent free will would be entangled with them. Right? So it's our le the least of our worries that our free will comes out in apparent in that case. Right? There's, there's stuff about um, Swiss national lottery machines. Whatever you do to try and keep these um, measuring device settings independent of the particles, you're doomed to failure because of this massive conspiratorial mechanism working behind the scenes. Um, so things that appear to have nothing in common, in fact, have a, have a hidden common cause, right? which, which is going to require this, this massive conspiratorial hidden mechanism in the past to keep everything lined up. Right? Um, our apparently free choices are the product of this hidden me mechanism, but the, the, the loss of free will is really the least of the worries of this approach. It's just, it's just um, too baroque, to put it mildly. Um, so let's try something else, right? Um, as Hugh has pointed out, right, uh, there's another way to implement this strategy. The, you know, the violation of independent strategy um, that does away with the mind-boggling conspiracy, right? Um, this is what I call the future common cause hypothesis, or FCC. Um, the trick is, if you put the common causes in the future, you can, you can let the measure measurement events themselves um, serve as the common cause that correlates the device setting with the particle properties, right? So these two events labeled FCC can act as the common causes. Um, so in this diagram, you know, there's no need to, to postulate some extraneous mechanism out there in the past, right? You've got the common causes in the future, and what, what's more, they're in the bits of apparatus you already have. Right? No, no extra bits of the world need to be invoked. Um, so you don't need a mind-boggling conspiracy, you just need a little bit of backward causation. Okay. Um, so... What's wrong with that? Um, Bell's comments about superdeterminism seem to be mostly directed at the, the past common cause hypothesis, or the mind-boggling one. Um, what did he think about the future common cause hypothesis as fatalistic? Well, you know, this is the quote I started with. About the only thing he said about this when, when Hugh prompted him was, I've not been able to make any sense of the notion of backward causation. When I think of it, I lapse quickly into fatalism. Um, Hugh says, in response, I suspect that Bell didn't appreciate that the common future hypothesis is very different from the common past hypothesis. Right? Um, so Hugh's diagnosis is that Bell didn't really understand the future common cause hypothesis. He didn't understand it as distinct from the past common cause hypothesis. Right? Um, here's what I want to argue right now is there is a, a genuine kind, a genuine worry about free will that's common to the future common cause and the past common cause hypothesis. Um, but I'm going to argue it, it's a, it's a relatively confined little worry, and it's certainly not 
fatal to the retrocausal project. So let's launch into thinking about free will in the context of superdeterministic or retrocausal theories. So, so the, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume compatibilism. Um, I'm going to assume that um, free will is compatible with causal determinism. Um, so, so what I have in mind here is just basically Hume, right? By liberty, then, we can only mean a power of acting or not acting according to the determinations of the will, right? Um, if freedom simply means the ability to do what you want, then it's fully compatible with determinism. Right? Um, to put things slightly differently, you know, a little more sort of Dennett-y way, uh, your actions are free to the extent to which you control them, right? Um, Nothing in what follows is going to hinge on any particular kind of compatibilism. I don't have any particular kind of compatibilist story in mind. And of course, compatibilism is controversial. Um, even if it's the majority position, I guess, in philosophy, not everyone's a compatibilist. Um, and if you like, you can press me to justify compatibilism, but I really don't have anything original to say there. Just say the usual kinds of things, right? I'm just going to assume it. Um, I should also mention in passing, but I'm also going to assume that free will is compatible with logical determinism, the existence of facts about the future, or in other words, with the, with the block universe. Right? Um, you might think that Bell's worries about retrocausation were worries about the block universe. Uh, and if you think that, then, then Hugh in his book does a you know, really nice job at, at showing that, that those worries are misplaced. Right? So you shouldn't be worried about the block universe and free will. Right. Okay. Um, so here's an easy dismissal of Bell's worry. It right? um, goes like this. Free will is compatible with determinism by assumption, but superdeterminism is just determinism. Right? Um, act, uh, events are either determined or they're not. There's no such thing as more determined than, deter than determined. They're just determined. So, so free will is compatible with superdeterminism. That's obviously too quick. Um, here's why it's too quick. Free will isn't compatible with just any deterministic scenario, right? Free will is compatible with determinism per se, but it's not compatible with just any deterministic scenario. Right? If, if space aliens are, by radio control, putting all the volitions and whims and stuff in your brain right now, then you're not free, right? It's a, it's a deterministic scenario, but it's one in which you're not free, you're a puppet, right? So, so free will isn't compatible with just about just any old deterministic scenario. Right? Um, what compatible, compatibilism requires is that the causal chains for free actions go via your agency, whatever that is, right? They have to go through you. Your free actions are the ones that go via you, right? Okay. So here's the, the, the sort of superficial worry, right? Superdeterminism, and I'll use that as a blanket term for either the, the past one or the future one, which may be a little tendentious, but never mind, just a word. Um, Superdeterminism of either kind, you might think, threatens this requirement. Um, in particular, in the retrocausal case, you might think, well, look, retrocausal influences would be external constraints, okay, in the Humean sense. OK. Um, so, so let's take a look at, at how, that's, how that might be fleshed out. Um, let's start with the past common cause hypothesis because it's easier to think about. First thing to notice is we don't have a theory instantiating the past common cause hypothesis, presumably because no one thinks it's worth trying to construct one. Right? It's just too mind-boggling. Um, so, so we don't know how such a thing would go. Right? Um, we don't know how a hidden mechanism might succeed in correlating particle properties with device settings. Right? Well, here's two ways it might go. Right? Possibility one, right? it might go act via your deep motivations leaving you, you in control. Right? Um, it might be that the way this mind-boggling conspiracy works is by you know, messing with your brain way back in your past so that today you choose setting A rather than settings B or C. That might be one way it works, in which case you're in control, right? The, uh, your choice is yours. Right? Possibility two, um, 
It acts directly on your whim, you know. Bell says you choose the setting based on a whim. The, the, the mind-boggling conspiracy just sticks the whim in your head. You think it's your whim, but it's a, it's a whim that's just been um, externally conditioned. It's caused directly by this conspiratorial mechanism, whatever it is. Um, so the first one leaves you free, the second one doesn't. And the thing to notice, I guess, is that the first possibility is much less plausible than the second if, if ranks of plausibility can be assigned to such intrinsically implausible theories. Maybe you can imagine, just vaguely, a mind-boggling conspiracy that could arrange things so that um, your choices are correlated with the properties of the particles. Um, but it's, it's way harder to imagine a mechanism that does that by manipulating the state of your brain 10 years ago. I mean, that seems to require uh, even more <laughs> godlike powers. Um, so it's hard to see how um, the past common cause hypothesis can leave your free will in, intact. Okay. So let's see if things run in a parallel way. Um, for the future common cause hypothesis. Again, we should say we don't have an explicit theory instantiating the future common cause strategy. So we don't know how the hidden mechanism might go that correlates particle properties um, with device settings. Right? It has to do with some retrocausal influences coming from the measurement events back to the um, particles, the source. We don't have an explicit um, an explicit theory. Um, now, I'm going to run this to make it parallel with what I said in the previous slide, and there's an obvious objection that this isn't what Hugh was doing, but put that aside for the Before moment. Why, why is this a, a common cause in the future as opposed to just a future cause? Uh, it, okay, maybe that'll be obvious now. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to treat it as a common cause, but the obvious response is, so you shouldn't treat it as a common cause. Um, so suppose you think of it as a common cause, right? There's, there's this cause in the future, and it affects your choice, and it affects the particles, both leads backwards. So it's a genuine future common cause. Suppose you thought of things that way. Then it looks like you've got the same two options, right? Either this future common cause, um, it affects your deep motivations 10 years ago, right? Leaving you in control. Um, or a second possibility, it just acts directly on your whim. Um, you think it's your whim, um, but in fact it was just implanted in your head by this future common cause. Right? Um, if that was the way of thinking of things, you were thinking of things, you might think, well, it's got to be the second, because the only way to get to your deep motivations, you know, your deep motivations, whatever they were, bubbled up and produced your whim, and you set the device, the only way to get back to your deep motiv motivations, tracing the causal story backwards is via your whim, right? The, the FCC, the whole point is not to um, postulate any extraneous mechanisms, right? The causal story has got to go back through you. Right? Um, so it looks like if this is a genuine common cause acting backwards on the, on the particle source or on you, then it's gonna have to act directly on your whim, um, in which case, uh, you're not free, right? The whim was caused by this future common cause, uh, not by your past motivations, whatever they may have, may have been. Um, so you might think this way, right? Well, there's, there's the vindication of Bell, Bell's worry. Uh, the past common cause hypothesis probably has to work direct, by directly causing your whim. Otherwise, it will be even more mind-boggling. And the future common cause hypothesis definitely has to work this way. Right? So it's not your whim any more than an implanted desire, you know, by radio control from space aliens is your desire. Right? Um, so you're not in control of the device setting. Um, and the PCC and the FCC apparently lead to the same kind of fatalism. Um, So, so that makes it look like Bell's right. 
you know, the, the PCC and the FCC both appear to lead to, to fatalism of, the, of precisely the same type. type. Um, but, you know, I've been presenting the future common cause hypothesis in, in, a, in a kind of funny way as a common cause and certainly not in the way that you presented it. Um, you might think, well, the FCC shouldn't, really shouldn't be thought of as a future common cause, it should be thought of as an, an intermediate cause, right? We don't have to have all the causal links going backwards, right? We can have um, the guy in the hat over there choosing the measuring device setting on the left, um, and that influences the FCC mechanism, whatever it is, and that sends a causal link backwards in time um, to the particle source. Same kind of thing goes on on the right. Um, okay. So if you think of the, the FCC hypothesis that way, um, then Bell's worry gets defused, right? The guys on the left and the right are fully in control of the device settings. And this FCC isn't really a common cause, it's just an intermediate cause. Um, there, is, there is a retrocausal link, but not both the links are retrocausal, which is one of them. Okay. So here's the difference between the FCC and the PCC, between the future one and the past one, the, one, the, the difference that Hugh thinks that Bell didn't sufficiently appreciate, right? Under the future common cause hypothesis, the device settings can be causes rather than effects. Um, so this is how Price depicts the retrocausal explanation of the Bell correlations. And in that case, there's clearly no threat of fatalism. Uh, your choice affects the device setting, uh, not vice versa. Um, so why think that that's the right way to put the FCC. Well, you might think, um, well, we can simply define the direction of cause, causation as the direction in which we control things. Right? That sounds promising. Right? Um, so here's Hugh in his book. What gives direction to the relation? What makes it appropriate, appropriate to say that it is our actions that fix the remote events rather than vice versa? Is that the actions concerned are our are are our actions, or products of our free choices. The fatalist basic mistake is to fail to notice the degree to which our talk of directed dependence rides on the back of our conception of ourselves as free agents. Okay. Um, so this sounds good. Right? Um, if our control defines the direction of, of causation, then trivially we control the device settings. Okay. Um, but we need to be a little careful, I guess, not to beg the question here. Right? Um, this is what I was trying to get at in my question to Phil, I guess. Um, the whole question we're considering here is whether or not you actually control something in this case. Right? Do you actually control the device settings or not? Um, that is, right, we have this self-conception of ourselves as free agents. Right? But that self-conception might be wrong. Um, and whether or not you control the device or vice versa looks like it might be an empirical question. And let me, let me try and flesh out uh, why it might look like it's an empirical question. So here's some possibilities. Some of them, some of them are implausible. Um, here's the first possibility. So here you are choosing a device setting A, B, or C. You might repeatedly try and fail to set the device setting according to your whim, right? That's what Bell wants you to do. Set it according to your whim. And you're trying to set the thing. You think, okay, I'm going to set it to A. But whenever you do that, you look back and you find you set it to B. Um, And that and that happens repeatedly, right? Whenever you know you try you try and set, or, or not all the time, but uh, but a significant proportion of the time will be enough, right? Significant proportion of the time you, you, know, you try and set it to B. You think you're going to set it to, to B, and you set it to C. Okay, That's, it's like what happens in grandfather paradox cases, right? You you point gun at, at, at granddad, but 
every time when you kind of pull the trigger, you slip on a banana peel. Um, in that case, your lack of freedom to control the devices will be evident to you. Now, that doesn't go without saying. I should be quick to say, you know, Lewis thought that in the grandfather paradox case, Tim was perfectly free to, to, to kill, kill grandfather, although he won't. Okay. So there's, there's certainly some subtleties there that we can, we can discuss. That response looks tricky to me, to say that Tim is free to kill grandfather, but he won't. But, um, particularly if you think of free will in terms of control. Um, but it doesn't go, to, go without saying that your lack of free will will be evident to, to you. Lewis begs to differ. Um, still, it seems like in that situation your lack of free will will be evident to you. You'd be frustrated. I thought I had control over this thing, but I don't. Okay. Um, you might say, yeah, but you know, you, you know that really you won't be frustrated in, in this way. Um, yeah, certainly. It's, it's certainly implausible to think. I don't know. Do we have direct evidence that you won't be frustrated in this way? Has anyone actually set an aspect type experiment using human experimenters? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe. I think in the original experiment, they just turned them. They, some, they some, like a bunch of runs for each set of so, so they did have pe people on each end. That's not with locality conditions. Yeah, yeah, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't have a locality condition. But, but they, they did actually do it by hand. So maybe, maybe they know, maybe at least if they were paying attention, they, they know that this doesn't occur. It's certainly wildly implausible, and you certainly wouldn't expect anything like that. So, so let's, let's go um, to something slightly less implausible. Right? Um, it seems to you um, that, your, that your whim causes the, de the, the device setting. Right? So you know, that, that's the way things look to you. Right? Yeah, every time I want to set it to A, I set it to A, and every time I want to set it to B, I set it to B. Right? So there's no there's no frustration of my of my will that's evident to me. Right? But still, um, it's possible um, that mapping your brain states as you do that shows that in fact you don't have that control. Right. So maybe when you ordinarily set a device. Right, you, you, we hook you to an fMRI machine when you set the device. You know, I say, pick, pick a setting at random, A, B, or C. Right? And in those cases, normally, right, your whim-generating cortex lights up, right? and, then, and then your motor cortex lights up. Right? Um, but we hook you to, a, to a, a, an EPR bell machine and also to an fMRI scanner. Right? And in that case, your whim-generating cortex, it just doesn't light up. It's like, Wow, the whim just comes out of nowhere when you're connected to one of these machines. Um, so in that case, um, you think you act freely. It seems to you that you act freely. But we have empirical evidence that you don't. Wait, how is, I thought you were a compatibilist. I don't see how that possibility is compatible with compatibilism. <laughs> um, So, why is it not compatible with compatibilism? There's a, the, the, the whims are tricky. I mean, I wish yeah, I really, that's the, that's yeah, whims are, whims are tricky. I mean, you, you, your normal compatibilist story, right, is, is um, you're free if what you do is the product of your, of your reasons and your desires and everything that, that's connected to your stable character. But whims aren't like that, right? Um, so, presumably, there's going to be some compatibilist story about whims. Right? What makes something my whim, as opposed to just an implanted whim? Whatever that is. Right. Um, okay, I thought that done. Yeah, whatever, whatever that story is, um, it might not occur in this case. But you're right, you're right. Whims are, whims are tricky for a compatibilist. Um, okay, so you might have empirical evidence that the, the future common cause it, the future common cause um, causes the device setting, not you, right? Now you might have empirical evidence that the FCC is a genuine common cause, in which case Bell's fatalist worry stands. Right? That's kind of implausible. How, how serious would it be if things turned out that way? Well, even if, that's like the, 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 the implausible worst case scenario, right? Even in that case, um, it's not so serious, I think. Right. Um, 
After all, compatible is freedom's never absolute. Um, you have a certain amount of freedom. Your freedom, the extent of your freedom, is the extent of your control. Right? There are some things you can do based on your volitions, but you can't do everything based on your volitions. You're free to check your phone right now. I invite you to, but not to move your phone telekinetically. Right? You're not free to do that. Um, okay. So suppose um, these implausible scenarios were right then they'd add a new and surprising restriction to your freedom. In cases of entanglement, in cases of you know, Bell-type experiments, um, it turns out you're not free to set the measuring devices, even though you know, maybe, maybe it feels like you are free, maybe it doesn't, but uh, you're not free to set the measuring devices. Okay. There's a new and surprising restriction to your freedom. Right? Um, similar to the new restrictions that arise in time travel cases, you're not free to kill your grandfather. Right? Um, but this isn't fatalism. Right? Um, fatalism, properly speaking, requires that you have no free control, not just limited free control. So just an, an extra little limitation on your free control isn't fatalism, it's just an extra little limit. OK. But all that's implausible, you're going to say, is, is just not going to work out that way. You, you know, setting. Um, measuring devices in Bell experiments, your will isn't going to be systematically frustrated. And if we do a brain scan on you, it's going to look exactly the same if you're connected to a, a Bell device as if you're not. Right? Um, why do we think that? Uh, I don't know, but seems plausible. Right? So suppose things work out in the best way, right? and um, the future cause is an intermediate cause, not a common cause. Right? Um, then Bell's worry is diffused, right? Uh, you cause the device setting which influences the particle properties via this future cause, right? Bell's fatalist worry is completely diffused. Right? Um, but even here, there's, there's I think, a, a lingering concern about free will. Right? Um, and here's the concern. There's something you're not free to do. You can freely control the device setting. But you're not free to, to destroy the correlation between the device setting and the particle properties. That's not something you're free to do. Right? Um, and typically, this is the kind of correlation, this kind of thing is something we're free to destroy. Right? Um, and in fact, we often rely on our freedom to destroy such correlations in doing science. This is the point about the variables. Um, So in a 1976 um, paper, uh, Shimoni, Clauser, and Horn take Bell to task for using the, the phrase at the whim of the experimenters. They say, you know, you can't, you can't invoke something as dubious as free will in a physics paper. Right? And Bell says roughly in response, I think I can, but if you don't like that, here's what I should say. A respectable class of theories, including contemporary quantum theory as it is practiced, have free external variables in addition to those internal to and conditioned by the theory. These variables are typically external fields or sources. They're invoked to represent experimental conditions. They also provide a point of leverage for free-willed experimenters if reference to such hypothetical metaphysical entities is permitted. I'm inclined to pay particular attention to theories of this kind, which seem to me most simply related to our everyday way of looking at the world. OK. Um, so, when ben, so when Bell was asked about free will, he replied in terms of free variables. Okay. Um, arguably, Bell was more concerned with free, free variables than with free will. Um, why? Well. The paper he was responding to by Shimoni, Horn, and Clauser, they, they argue um, like this. Right? Um, we need the independence of particle properties and device settings. Uh, we need it because it's a prerequisite for science. Um, and that's precisely what retrocausal theories deny. Right? They deny the independence of particle properties and device settings. Um, they're designed to violate this assumption so as to get around Bell's theorem. So why think this is a prerequisite for science? Well, otherwise, the properties of measured particles would differ from the properties those we, from those we don't measure. 
right? Um, it's fine if the measuring device affects the state of the measured system a little, right? A mercury thermometer that's colder than the liquid you put it in, if it lowers the temperature of the, the, the liquid a little bit, that's not such a big worry. Right? Um, but in this case, right, the presence of the measuring device changes the measured properties considerably. Right? In the absence of measuring devices, uh, Bell's theorem shows that the spins of the particles um, agree at most two-thirds of the time. In the presence of the measuring devices, it's three-quarters. Um, so there's a big effect. Um, so what we find out from our measurements isn't the same as the properties the system would have if we weren't measuring them. Um, and this is a particular kind of skeptical worry, right? The skeptical worry that the world behaves very differently when we're looking than when we're not looking. So Shimani, Horn, and Clausen conclude um, skepticism of this sort will essentially dismiss all results of scientific experimentation, right? Um, if you can't rely on your measuring results re revealing the world as it is when you're not looking, um, then you can't rely on science. Okay. Um, so the idea is that, that the, both the past common cause hypothesis and the future common hy cause hypothesis deny the availability of free variables and that threatens the whole enterprise of science, right? which makes the consequences for free will a pretty um, trivial concern. Uh, but never, nevertheless, let's take a look at them. Um, so the worry about free variables is straightforwardly connected to a worry about free will. Um, typically, we can destroy any correlation by freely choosing one of the variables. Um, <laughs> But according to both the past common cause and the future common cause hypothesis, um, the world thwarts any attempt we might make um, to, to destroy the Bell correlations. Um, any attempt you make to render the variables independent um, is fated to fail. So that the control you usually have over the independence of variables isn't present here. You usually have this degree of control, and it's missing. Um, so this is a restriction on the scope of my freedom. Right? It's not a, not a huge restriction, but it's a, a restriction nevertheless. There are things that I, that I thought I could do, that I thought I was free to do, uh, that it turns out I'm not free to do. Right? Um, let me run an analogy to see if this helps. Right? This, is a, this is a conjuring trick that I, that I borrowed from my daughter. It's not a very sophisticated conjuring trick, but it's a, it's a conjuring trick. Right? So it has six colored bars on the front. So, um, Matt, pick a number between one and six. Seven? Yes. Four. Four, okay. One, two, three, four. So you pick green, right? So then I say the magic word quantum collapse and it turns green. Um, so so that, that's the, the conjuring trick. I mean, it's not a, not a very sophisticated trick, right? And there's nothing funny about the stick. It's just got six colored bands on one side and it's green on the other. And you know, I just flipped it with my hand. Um, so the surprising thing, well, you, you know, probably see through the trick straight away. It's, it's a trick for little kids. But um, the surprising thing is, if there's a surprising thing, is this, right? Um, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's always green on one side. Um, so the surprising thing is, you think you freely cho choose the color, right? Um, in which case, this trick ought to work only one in six at the time, but presumably it works all the time, or I wouldn't have shown it to you. Um, if I'd chosen the number, right, there'd be no mystery, right? There'd be a good common cause explanation, right? Um, but you think that you can destroy that common cause explanation because you choose the number. Um, and the way it works, of course, is this is a simple example of, of a magician's force, right? Whatever number you choose, I end up pointing to green. Right? Um, so you're free to choose the number, but you're not free to choose the color. Or you know, you thought you were freely choosing the color, but you weren't. You were just freely choosing the number. So green was not number four. Um, green is green is number four if I count from the top. Right? So it's. 
So like like a lot of things to do with. Three, you would have found another way to land on the Yeah, you say three, I go one, two, three. The and other ones it. are a little more contrived. It, it was it only wasn't it wasn't transparent what I was doing because you chose four or three. If you chose six, I have to go S I X. <laughs> so so. <laughs> Yeah, it's not one of those things. Yeah, um, but um, yeah, you you think you can render you you think you can render um, the common cause explanation. You know, you think you can destroy it. You can you can get around what I want, right? By freely choosing a number, and you are freely choosing the number, but you're not freely choosing the color. Um, there's a restriction on your freedom here. You think you're freely choosing the color, but you're not. Right? Um, Okay, so to that extent, the, you know, the extent of your free will is limited. Um, how serious are these problems? Um, well, the most serious worry is the threat of skepticism that Clauser, Shimonian, and horn. Yeah. Right. Um, but in the context, if we really had a retrocausal theory, I think we could lay the skeptical worry to rest. Right. Um, the effect of measuring devices on particle properties, right? If you've got a genuine retrocausal theory, is presumably law governed. But then the then the threat of skepticism recedes. Right. Um, if you can calculate the effect of the measuring device on the measured system, then there's no real skeptical worry, right? You can stick a very cold thermometer in a glass of water, and it's going to lower the temperature of the water. But if you want to be careful, you can take, you can, you can account for that, right? Um, using your own theory. So that is, it's, this is just a kind of, um, the, the, the correlations that appear on measurement but not otherwise are just a particularly striking observer effect. And observer effects are odd, but they don't necessarily lead you into skepticism, not a global skepticism, provided you can take them into account, right? provided you have a theory that allows them, you to take them into account. Um, you may not be able to directly observe what the world is like when nobody's looking, right? but your theory tells you what the world is like when nobody's looking, and the theory is corroborated by um, the results you get when you are looking. Right? No deep um, skeptical work. Um, you are free to set the measuring devices um, in these cases. Um, but you're not free to thereby destroy correlations involving those settings. Um, so that is a restriction on your freedom. And it's not a very far-reaching one. Um, and I don't know if it's the one that Bell was intuiting, but there is one there. There is one there in the vicinity. If you think of if, if you think of freedom in terms of control in the compatibilist way, right? there are things you can't control that you would have thought you could. And this new restriction on your freedom um, it only it only occurs for in these special situations when you're dealing with entangled systems, right? Um, so presumably it's naturally circumscribed by the coherence or something like that. It's, like, it's not something you have to worry about um, in your everyday life. It's only if you happen to be faced with um, one of these uh, Bell-type scenarios um, that, your, that your freedom is going to be circumscribed in this way. Um, or if you're faced with a, a conjuring trick. Um, okay. So... What I wanted to do um, was to think about freedom from a compatibilist point of view in terms of control. And there's a sense, perhaps not a very important sense, but a sense in which, in which Bell's right, that the, the past common cause hypothesis and the, and the future cause hypothesis uh, similarly, similarly make some things fated rather than free. Right? There are some things you can't control that you would otherwise have thought that you could control. Uh, they, both the past common cause and the future cause hypothesis entail new restrictions on the scope of compatibilist free will. Um, 
how, what's the extent of these restrictions? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the details of the theories but via which these two um, superdeterministic theories, su superdeterministic hypotheses are implemented. Um, you know, we don't have the full theory in either case, so we don't know the extent of the, of the difficulty. Right? Um, maybe you can freely choose the device setting. Right? Looks like probably you can, although I, you know, I don't think that's a foregone conclusion. Um, with, the, if, with the PCC, it looks much less likely that you can choose the device setting, but the t PCC, of course, is wildly implausible anyway. Right? With the FCC, it looks like plausibly you can free freely choose the device setting, um, but either way, you can't freely choose to destroy the device par particle correlation. Right? The, the future one definitely offers the hope, best hope for a minimal restriction on compatibilist free will. Well, um, but in any case, however it turns out, the restriction isn't going to amount to, to global fatalism. Right? So, so if, if Bell's fatalist worry was, then everything is up to fate, that's got to be misplaced. You, know, you have control over a lot of things in any case. Um, your control is just illusory in certain special cases. Is that, is that fatalism? Well, not in any full-blown sense, because your know, control is illusory in, in a restricted range of cases. Um, so, bottom line, I don't think you know, Bell was kind of right, but I don't think there's any real threat to the retrocausal program. He shouldn't have given up so soon. Okay. Thank you.